U.S. administrations have protested against Dr. Afridi's continued imprisonment over the years. There's even been talk of a prisoner swap, but a deal to free Afridi has never materialized. You know, this would seem like a no-brainer. To make sense of all of this, we are joined by Glenn Carl. He's CIA's former national intelligence officer. He's joining us live from Boston. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. You know, this is a part of U.S. aid to Pakistan. It's standing withheld as of now. What does this really say about the certain trust deficit, if you mean, if you may, between Pakistan and the United States? Yes, well, thank you for having me. The uh, the trust level, I guess, is how you you turn turn termed it, uh, has been uh, poor for decades. Really, uh, the Pakistan for the United States has always been a a troublesome, uh, difficult ally, uh, a country that the U.S. has felt uh, compelled to uh, work with, but that has frequently uh, taken policies and supported terrorist groups, even. Uh, that the U.S. finds uh, appalling. Uh, In this instance, uh, the U.S. has for 11 years uh, tried to uh, have Pakistan free Mr. Afridi uh, because he was uh, convicted of a spurious crime uh, and actually should be uh, viewed as a hero. Uh, However, in the U.S. context, the pressure uh, most directly comes from Congress which has voted to withhold aid until the government of Pakistan frees up Freedy, rather than from the executive branch, from the president, which has been more circumspect uh, in its approach to Pakistan. And do you think $33 million will be enough to pressure Pakistan at this point to release Dr. Shaquille Afridi, considering the fact that in this new budget alone, there's something like $200 million for gender equality issues and other border security issues being given to Pakistan. And then you have this on the sidelines. Right. Well, that's an important point that you make. $33 million was chosen uh, because it is $1 million for every year that Mr. Afridi was convicted and sentenced uh, to serve in jail. Uh, It is a symbolic act. Um, I think we can put ourselves in the shoes of the Pakistani policymakers uh, and uh, imagine how they would respond. Any country will not respond favorably to this kind of slap and uh, unless it's an existential issue. uh, And that's not the case. So uh, as we have seen before, uh, Pakistan is and and we already have heard um, in the last 24 hours, the Pakistan will refuse to um, do what the United States is attempting to to pressure it to do, and uh, people will just become angrier on both sides uh, without Mr. Afridi's winning his freedom. Okay, we'll be keeping a close watch. Glenn Carl, thank you so much for joining us on We On, and we hope to speak to you soon. Anytime. Let's move on to Sri Lanka, where Sri Lanka's former president, who was ousted from power following months of protests, has reportedly left for the United States with his family. This is according to reports that he and his family left for the U.S. via Dubai. This is Gotabaya Rajapaka's first foreign trip since returning to Sri Lanka more than three months ago. In July, his visa request was reportedly rejected by the U.S. as he was trying to flee the country after promising to quit office. Gotabaya held a dual citizenship of Sri Lanka and the U.S., but had to give up his American citizenship ahead of the 2019 elections in Sri Lanka because of a law that barred foreign nationals from running for the presidency. He won the national elections with a resounding majority, but soon became the country's most unpopular leader amid a severe economic meltdown, which continues to bleed the country and its citizens to this day. In July, when the country was rocked by massive protests over the worsening economic situation, the 73-year-old politician fled Sri Lanka to the Maldives. After staying briefly in Singapore and Thailand, he returned to Sri Lanka in September. However, in August, Sri Lankan media reported that the former president 
had applied for a U.S. green card to return to America and settle there with his family. The reports claim that Rajapaka's lawyers in the United States had already begun the procedure in July for his application to obtain the green card, as he was eligible to apply due to his wife being a U.S. citizen. Sri Lanka, a country of 22 million people, is going through its worst economic crisis since its independence in 1948, which was triggered by an acute scarcity of foreign exchange reserves. There have also been street protests in Sri Lanka against the government since early April due to its mishandling of the economic crisis. But Rajapaka's trip certainly raises some questions. Did the U.S. finally have a change of heart, or is there more to his trip? For more on this, our correspondent, the Sunni Athauda, sent us this report from Colombo. Take a look. The news of former President Gotabaya Rajapaksa traveling to the United States via Dubai along with his family in what appears to be a private visit has got many Sri Lankans questioning as to whether Sri Lankan authorities are taking matters quite seriously in terms of holding the former president accountable for causing Sri Lanka's worst economic crisis since independence, where for much of this year Sri Lanka did see mass protests calling. For the former president to step down, in which, towards the final few weeks and days of these protests, former president Gotabaya Rajapaksa was seen fleeing the country. However, this visit appears to be a private visit along with his family. Yet, the sentiment of the public remains the same. Reporting for We on World is One from Colombo, I'm Dasmiya Tauda. Let's bring you back here in the United States, where massive winter storms raging across the country continues to disrupt travel plans of many as thousands of flights remain canceled on Tuesday. There's been mayhem at airports with massive flights cancellations. Not only that, but passengers have been stranded and baggage piled up at numerous airports across the country. The travel disruptions have primarily been caused by Southwest Airlines. After the low-cost carrier continued canceling flights due to harsh winter weather storms, the Dallas-based domestic carrier canceled about 2,600 flights on Tuesday, which accounted for 86 percent of the total flight cancellations of the day. The airline has also canceled 2,500 flights for Wednesday and nearly 1,000 for Thursday. Had a text message like nine o'clock last night that her flight was canceled. I was on the phone for like four hours、um, on hold, no answer. So we woke up this morning. I said, "Let's just come to the airport to see what's going on." So clearly, the flights are canceled, 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 and more canceled. I was supposed to come in on December the twenty-third, Christmas Eve, Eve, and her flight got canceled initially. So we rebooked, and it got canceled. Rebooked, got canceled. Rebooked again, and it got canceled. Finally, she was able to get on a flight today. The cancellations have left many travelers in a state of chaos. As you saw, many were left stranded and had to wait long hours at airports to catch another flight, while others faced the challenge of tracking down their lost luggage. Thousands of bags have piled up in airports around the country. I came to see my brother, and、um, I wanted to surprise him, and I got stuck in Dallas. And I, I spent Christmas by myself, and here I am. And I wasn't expecting to find my luggages, and I literally had nothing. And Southwest didn't want to pay for anything.、Um, they didn't want to reimburse me. They didn't want to put me in a hotel. So I dished out extra money to fly with American Airlines, and I finally got here. So, yeah. And you, you found your bags. And I found my bags. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden, on his official handle tweet, said that the administration was working to ensure airlines were held accountable, while other officials have pressed for the airlines to issue refunds. At least 12,000 flights have been scrubbed by Southwest and other airlines in the country since last week, in the wake of the massive winter storm that has killed over 60 people in the country. Officials have warned. The danger is not over as blizzard conditions will continue in some parts of the country. Western New York is the worst hit by the storm. There is over a meter of snow dumped in the region. In Buffalo, military police have been called in to enforce driving bans 
on snow-choked roads. I have been advised that 100 military police are being brought in, as well as additional troops from the New York State Police uh, uh, Department are coming in to manage traffic control because it has become so evident that too many people are ignoring the ban. Uh, I've been told they will all arrive later today and they will start being situated at entrances to the city of Buffalo as well as major intersections, not allowing people to get through. Warmer temperatures of around 10 degrees Celsius have been forecast by the weekend, right in time for New Year's Eve celebrations. But officials have warned that melting snow could result in minor flooding. Already under fire from House Democrats and some of his Republican colleagues over making up large parts of his resume, New York Republican George Santos's worries seem to be far from over after revelations that the U.S. representative-elect lied about his education and employment history while running for Congress. Santos is now facing fresh criticism over his claims of Jewish heritage. While Santos has admitted to fabricating sections of his resume, including his past work experience and education, and has apologized, he says that he intends to serve in Congress. The fresh revelation about him not being Jewish, as claimed, has brought in more trouble for Santos. In his earlier interviews, Santos reportedly claimed that his grandparents, quote, survived the Holocaust and that his mother was Jewish. But in a recent interview with the New York Post, the Republican said that he never claimed to be Jewish. After his interview, the Republican Jewish coalition said the incoming congressman had misrepresented his heritage and will not be welcomed at any future events. On Monday, Santos admitted that he did not graduate from any college or university despite previously claiming he had degrees from Baruch College and New York University. The New York Republican also admitted that he never worked directly for the financial firms Citigroup and Goldman Sachs. In November, Santos defeated Democrat Robert Zimmerman to win election to the Congress from a New York district that was represented by Democrat Tom Sousey, who ran for governor this year. On Tuesday, Zimmerman called on Santos to resign and face him in a special election. Several members of President Joe Biden's party have demanded that House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy call a vote to expel Santos if he does not quit. to live in such a diverse part of the country. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has unveiled new goals for the country's military for 2023. The new plan hints at another year of intensive weapons tests and tensions. State media reports say that he made his plans public at an ongoing meeting of the ruling Workers' Party. The report says Kim reviewed the situation on the Korean Peninsula and the border political landscapes. Kim's report at the meeting set forth new key goals. North Korea says the goals will bolster self-reliant defense capabilities to be pushed ahead in 2023. Under the multilaterally changing situation, the third generation leader said that the direction for what he called anti-enemy struggle. However, state media reports did not provide details on those goals. But Kim's remarks indicate that North Korea will continue to accelerate its military buildup. During the plenary meeting, Kim also pointed out a series of serious shortcomings in areas such as science, education and health and suggested ways to overcome them. North Korean leaders previously made speeches on New Year Day, but in recent years, Kim has called days-long party gatherings at the end of the year to announce major policy decisions. Tesla shares fell 11.4% yesterday after a report said that Tesla was planning to run a reduced production schedule in January at its Shanghai plant. This has sparked worries of a drop in demand in the world's biggest car market. 
The stock, which fell to its lowest in more than two years and had its worst day in eight months, was the biggest drag on the benchmark S&P 500 index and the tech-heavy Nasdaq index. It also lost more than half of its value since the start of October, as investors worry that Twitter was taking much of chief executive Elon Musk's time while fretting about his stake sale in the electric car market. The world's most valuable automaker's production cuts at the Shanghai plant come amid a rising number of COVID-19 infections in the country. Meanwhile, a analysis showed that prices of used Tesla cars were falling faster than those of other car makers, weighing on demand for the company's new vehicles rolling off the assembly line. All right, moving on to the world of store, sports, Luka Doncic created NBA history on Tuesday. The Dallas Mavericks star became the first player in the league to score 60 points, 20 rebounds, and 10 assists in a game. The Slovenian has been one of NBA standout players in the last few years and has been touted as the heir to LeBron James's throne. And on Tuesday, he had arguably the best night of his career against the New York Knicks. He reached a host of milestones. The 23-year-old became the first player in Mavericks history to score 60 points in a game. It was also the league's highest scoring performance of the season. Doncic single-handedly kept Dallas in the game against New York. The Mavericks were down nine with 33 seconds left in regulation time before getting even in a back-and-forth sequence. It was capped by Doncic intentionally missing a free throw so he could eventually tie the game with an 11-foot jumper. His heroic continued in overtime, and Dallas was ultimately able to complete a 126-121 point triumph. No, I don't think so. You know, I, I know it was two seconds or something. I just threw it up. Hopefully, it went in. We saw it on the on the on the screen right now. We're watching NBA TV. But yeah, I mean, it's just incredible to be in those kind of comparisons. I mean, I don't know how I say it. the comparison. Yeah, this uh, just to be with those guys at any stage. You know, it's amazing for me. An American actor, comedian, and author. Whoopi Goldberg has once again apologized for her comments claiming that the Holocaust was, quote, not about race. The 67-year-old apologized days after a recent interview in which she reiterated the same Holocaust slur that got her suspended from The View, a show she hosts with other women, back in February. In her new statement, Goldberg said that she was just attempting to clarify that she was simply referencing her past hurtful remarks, not doubling down on them. She said, quote, I'm still learning a lot, and believe me, I heard everything everyone said to me. I believe that the Holocaust was about race, and I am still as sorry as I was then that I upset, hurt, and angered people. My sincere apologies again, especially to everyone who thought this was a fresh rehash of the subject. I promise it was not, end of quote. Keeping in mind with what some see as a rise in anti-Semitism, she said, quote, I want to be very clear when I say that I always stood with the Jewish people and always will. My support for them has not wavered and never will. Almost 10 months ago, Goldberg made similar comments at the beginning of the year of the episode of The View and then repeated them that night on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Whoopi claimed that in addition to Jews, Nazis targeted people of African descent, because they were physically different and went on to suggest that Jews had an easier time hiding from the Nazis than black people by blending in with white people during the Holocaust. While she received online backlash for this, why she made such bizarre comments is still unclear. Is she using Holocaust as her punching bag? Or is it just that she is having a misguided idea of racism? That's all the time we have from this news desk live from New York City with me, Susan Tehrani. Thank you so much for staying with us and watching. I'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. But don't go away. More news and updates coming up on We On World as One. Well.
many other uh, official dress uh, Arab. Yo One Health Resort is unique, the only one of its kind. Experience the four paths of natural wellness. Yoga, Ayurveda, Acupuncture, and Naturopathy. Each uniquely customized program improves the whole person to make every person whole. Come to Yo One Health Resort. Make your reservation at yoone.com. It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. Extreme climate events warn of impending doom. Is the world heading towards a climate catastrophe? Watch Weon's Climate Tracker weekdays at 12 p.m. GMT, 5.30 p.m. IST. How to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up an, a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. Show us your faithfulness. Show us your trustworthiness. Show us your honesty. Prove us wrong. We desperately need you to prove us wrong. God help us all if you fail to prove us wrong. God help us. One trillion species, 7.8 billion humans, 1.9 million species extinct, one planet. Where are we heading? What should we do? Watch Climate Tracker only on Wheel. World is one. From the world's most volatile region, conflicts over faith and boundaries. Stories of death, destruction, despair and hope. 
Weon brings you to the heart of the action. Incisive analysis, unrivaled perspective, and exclusive ground reports. Watch West Asia Post every Friday at 8.30 p.m. IST with me, Radi Francis. Only on Weon, world is one. Stay connected with the world through Weon. Like the page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter for new alerts. Instagram for videos and images. And the website for the latest news, views and analysis. Weonews.com. World is one. makes your office a sacred space why do we do what we do it's a question we all must ask ourselves our jobs have come to define who we are how much money we make our ambitions our goals 2022 it marked the end of remote work the end of zoom calls and at leisure the end of working endless office hours a return to the office a changed workforce was resuming work I'm Haim Korsara and this is Office 2.0. What a year it's been. We emerged from the shadow of the pandemic. Though reluctantly, officers made the move to call employees back to office. It marked the end of remote work, the end of attending Zoom calls and athleisure, the end of working endless office hours and a return to the office. But little did employers know a changed workforce was resuming work. Their priorities had changed. Yes, change was in the air. I'm Haim Korsaroya and this is Office 2.0, your workplace trends report of 2022. Why does your workplace matter to you? What makes your office a sacred space? Why do we do what we do? It's a question we all must ask ourselves. Our jobs have come to define who we are, how much money we make, our personal ambition, our lifestyle. Which is why it's high time we start caring. Fact, the average person will spend 90,000 hours at work over a lifetime. 90,000! It's fair to say your workplace will impact your quality of life. The year 2022 marked a return to office spaces for a global workforce. After two years of being locked down and working from home, and big changes followed. A bulk of offices said you have to return to the concrete jungle. We had US President Joe Biden urging Americans in March 2022 to return to in-person work. Big tech giants tweaked their own policies and played with hybrid work models. Many wondered, are remote jobs really disappearing? Yes and no. We saw a dip in remote working. One analysis found that just one out of seven job postings on LinkedIn in the United States offered remote work as an option in October 2022. But a changed workforce demanded something else. After two years of being locked down, managing a grueling job with personal chores, workers knew that going back was not an option. They realized that the office was not the only space which mattered. 
work from home meant that the home also took center stage. We reconnected with our loved ones, rejigged our priorities and demanded that our managers understand the same. So began the great return to office debate. Take a look at this survey, it's from December 2022. 41 biggest ideas that will change our world in 2023. It clearly says that the future is a balance between hybrid and remote work. A LinkedIn survey predicts that hybrid work is here to stay. Even if bosses wanted to run a tight ship, employees were in no rush to return to their desks. Flexibility became the name of the game. Women in particular drove the flexibility at work wave. Remember during lockdowns, they had to carry the burden of juggling family with work, screaming kids, ailing elders, household demands. Women had to handle them all while attending Zoom calls. And so they are demanding flexible work options. In some cases, they won the battle. But unfortunately,